everyone. I'm Marit Leonard, Regional Manager to us LGBTQ+, Business Development for the Pacific and the Yukon Atiri Bank Group. I am delighted to be with you today. The last few years have been challenging and recognize the pandemic has impacted many members of the 2 else LGBTQ+, community unequally. It has reminded us that we need each other to help create a real and impactful change. In such a time of uncertainty, thank you for continuing the work needed to help create change for the 2S LGBTQ plus community. At TD, we have been long-standing supporters of the 2S LGBTQ plus community and remain committed to helping create a more inclusive and sustainable future. That's why for our focus pride 2022 is to keep creating progress. We acknowledge how far we've come as a society, but we recognize there's still much work to do. Through the TD Ready commitment, our aim is to help create the conditions that members of the community need to feel like they can fully participate and succeed in a changing world. We provide unwavering support to over 175 tours of LGBTQ plus initiative year round. Dr. Peter Hitz Foundation, a Loving Spoon Food and Rainbow Foundation of Hope are just a few examples of supported organization in our region. And so today and every day, we stand with the community to honor what has been achieved. Yet, we are reminded of the change still needed so we can continue to celebrate each year. Together, we can keep creating progress with the 2 LGBTQ plus community. Thank you and happy pride. Learn more at td.com slash forever progressing. Hello, and welcome to the third Queer History Panel with 2S LGBTQAI plus members of our community. My name is Charmaine De Silva. I'm the news director at Sydney News Vancouver and the past co-chair of Vancouver Pride. I am excited to be here with an incredible diverse panel that has generously agreed to share their stories. Welcome back. Uh, let's get started by meeting our incredible panel who's here today with us. We're going to start with Brandon. Brandon Yan is the executive director of Out on Screen, a BC film and education nonprofit that produces the Vancouver Queer Film Festival, Out in Schools. Brandon identifies as a queer man of mixed Chinese white heritage. Hi, thank Hi, you for having thanks. me. Thanks for being here. Uh, Oreen Askew, also known as DJ Osho, is a passionate and energetic DJ and inspirational speaker. She's a recipient of an Indigenous Business Award and a standout award from the Vancouver Pride Society. Osho is a pillar of Vancouver's LGBTQ plus community, serving on the boards of the Queer Arts Festival, Out on Screen, and Vancouver Pride. Osho is Afro-Indigenous and a proud member of the Squamish Nation and a former member of the Squamish Nation Council. Oreen recently received her Squamish ancestral name, Tamalia. Welcome, Oreen. Thank you for having me. We also have with us Chris Morrissey. Uh, after Chris returned from Santiago, Chile with her partner, Bridget Cole, she began her advocacy work on immigration and refugee issues that impact LGBTQ plus people. In 1992, Chris challenged Canada's exclusion of same-sex relationships from family sponsorship in, fe in federal court. And as one of the founding members of Legit Canadian Immigration for Same-Sex Partners in 1992, and Rainbow Refugee Committee in 2000, she has worked tirelessly for recognition and fairness for LGBTQ plus people seeking refugee protection uh, or family reunification in Canada. As a community development worker here uh, in Canada, she has worked with women leaving domestic violence and LGBTQ plus elders. And she is an officer of the Order of Canada. Thank you for, for being here, Chris. Thanks for inviting me. 
Uh, Kay, also known as Carmela Barr, has had an interest in theater and entertainment starting at a very young age, which led them to the wonderful world of drag. Carmela has been doing drag in Vancouver for eight years and is known for the amazing balance of emotion and glamour that they bring to their performances. And that balance earned them the title of Miss Congeniality in 2016 and eventually Miss Cobalt 6 in 2017. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And we also have Paige Frewer, uh, who is the co-founder and operator of Eastside Studios and the host and organizer of the drag show Man Up. Paige has been producing and facilitating queer cultural events, DIY uh, venue spaces, and community engagement processes around equity and inclusion since 2008. And in 2013, they helped create the buddy system in response to an incident of sexual violence outside a Man Up event, which has now expanded as a decentralized network of harm reduction trained peer support staff who support queer and non-queer events around the city. And Paige is also currently serving their second term on the City Arts and Culture Advisory Committee. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, we are so lucky that all of you uh, have generously shared your time with us as you can reading these these bios it's clear that you know you're all pretty busy people so thank you so much um you know this is the third time that we have done the queer history panel and it's i i think so important for us to have these conversations around our community because uh first of all i admit you know growing up in uh, vancouver I didn't really know a lot about our history and I think you know a lot of us spend a lot of time being inundated with a lot of uh, American uh, queer history and we don't spend enough time talking about our own so I'm, I'm so glad that you're all here to help us have this conversation in our community. Um, I wanted to start with talking about coming out um, and coming out in Vancouver over the years because the experience is obviously very different depending on when that was and and what your community experience was. I, I don't know if any of you wanted to s kick things off with taking that question about uh, and if, you know if you did come out in Vancouver what that was like for you. I'll do it. I'll, my coming out experience I was really privileged to have a very um, open and accepting family. Um, so it was funny, like, people knew I was queer before I knew I was queer. So when I came out, most people were like, yeah, and kind of thing. And I was just like, well, if you knew, you could have told me a little earlier kind of thing. Um, but no, I've it, just sort of dealing with, like in media, we're always like shown like the prince meets a princess and like just all these like heteronormative ideals and just like being a young queer child you're like aware that like you know what love is or you're broadcasted with a certain idea of what love is or what love should be and then just growing up and realizing that like you still have a concept of love and what that means but it just might look a little different than what other people's version of it is and i had a family that was very open and accepting of my queerness and my non binariness and just really wanting me to be a full actualized person that's just happy and I'm really grateful for that. That's awesome. And and then navigating that outside of your family around how was that yeah. process and also like I think I was like a very like I'm still quite outgoing, but I think that that also helped me because <laughs> I'm like tooting my own horn, but I do feel like I can really connect with people and it's I, I thank you I was gonna say I am kind of charming uh, <laughs> but I, I it's easier to sort of connect with people and really when you feel that you're being seen and appreciated you want to like like sort of reflect that energy back to people regardless of their experience and I just try to mirror that and I feel like I get as much love and acceptance that I'm giving out uh, because that's what I got when I was younger, so I want that to be sort of my legacy, I guess you could say. Well, it so. just goes to show the impact of having 
that support, right? Well, and it doesn't even need to be like just from people that you feel as connected to. Like for me, it, it was my adoptive family, um, but it was friends as well. And for many of the people, it was I was the first like queer person they knew because I grew up in like Coquitlam, and there were very few queer people and people of color in general. So I was. Uh, knocking down a lot of firsts for I feel like many people, but they got there. Yeah. Well, thank you for yeah. doing that. Does anybody wa else want to share their stuff? Well, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go next because it's a, a little bit like at the opposite end of the spectrum in the sense that um, I, I came back to Canada um, in 1989. I left Canada in 1960 when I was a young thing and came back in 89 in my mid mid to late 40s. I think I was about 47 when I came back to when I came back to Vancouver. And that's basically when I started to come out more publicly. Um, I had sort of struggled with my sexual orientation for many many years and um, I remember I remember one of my early days in Vancouver was I had heard about little sisters, and I thought, oh, I think maybe I'll maybe I'll go there and see see what there is. And so it was the days when Little Sisters was on Thurlow Street, and I remember climbing up that rickety rickety staircase, looking at all the posters around, and I hid in the I hid in between the in between the bookcase shelves. I didn't want anybody to know I was there. So then I sneak, snuck back down again. So then, then the other pieces I said to, when I came out initially to family members, it was my brother I came out to first, and I said to him, so what do you think if I come out to mom and dad? And he said, well, that'll be another nail in the old man's coffin. <laughs> so um, having grown up in a very Roman Catholic family, having spent, um, what, 29 years as a nun in the convent, uh, you know, I carried a, a lot of that baggage with me. Um, but um, through force of circumstances, having lived in, in South America and worked under military dictatorship, I had learned a lot of skills. And I had learned from people um, what it means to organize and what it means to come together and what it means to kind of solve your, solve your problems collectively. So that's kind of what, what then moved me into sort of saying, okay, I, I got to do something here. I can't. I can't just sit around and and wait for somebody to do something for me. So, so yeah. So it's it's been a journey. Um, I was very conscious of the fact that when I was phoning Handy Dart yesterday, the day before, to make a booking to come here, they asked me why was I why was I going to North Vancouver. I said, well, I'm going to be filmed for for something, and they said, oh yeah, what? So I said, well, then I thought, no, am I going to say it's something for the Pride Society? <laughs> you know, that even now, after all these years, I still feel that, uh, that inner sort of concern and, and feeling. I mean, I'm, I'm very out. I've been out very publicly. And still there is that little piece inside of me that always kind of is, <gasps> that takes my breath away, right? So, but I've been very b blessed and very fortunate to have had lots of friends and lots of support and, and uh, through, throughout the last number of 30 some years already. 30 some years, it's hard to believe, yeah. Well, we're, we're, we are all, I think, so lucky that you decided to, to focus on that, that activism and the work that you've done because it's, it's just had such a tremendous impact. On our well, it was so. good for us. It's what we needed to do for ourselves. So yeah, so I'm glad we did it for us, and I'm glad it worked for other people as well. Yeah, so many other people. Yeah. yeah. Any anyone else want want to? I share? wanted to riff off of what um, Chris was saying too. That you know, as as public and out of a person as I am, I personally feel like I'm still coming out, and. Um, I by that mean that you know I have been identifying as um, you know gender queer for a number of years, but have um, you know to this day had difficulty embracing the label of trans. And you know I've been in the queer community and organizing for you know well over a decade, and um, I I certainly have those moments too that I'm you know I. I got top surgery in the fall and that was a really exciting, you know, big new chapter for myself and 
something that I've been kind of working towards and waiting for and wanting for a very long time. And, um, you know, even at, at 36, I, you know, I feel like that opened up a, you know, layer of um, potential vulnerability for myself to now sort of be even more visibly non-cis. Um, yeah, so I think it's just like been good for me to be honest about that, you know? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. You talk about both of you that the fact that we, you know, continuously come out. It's not just this one incident or period of our lives. It's it's constant. You know, I, I experience it as a as a parent. Uh, our daughter is five and, you know, there's oh, well, where, where's Clara's dad? And it's like you have to explain every single time that, you know, they don't they don't have a dad. And it's 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 a real life thing. And it's like, gosh, like, you know. But yeah, no, I think I think so many of us can identify with that. Well, and if I may, like, add off that, I I'm an educator in my everyday life, and like, do I want to like just scream to the mountaintops that I'm queer and whatever? Yes, but like, I understand that with education having that um, like title of a teacher, there are many people that do view like the soji sort of way of thinking as like. Unfor this is an unfortunate word, but indoctrination, when it's just like giving people the idea that other people exist in the world and they're just there. It's nothing more than that. It's not converting anyone. It's literally just letting people know that there might be people who are trans or any member of the LGBTQ2IA plus community. And I think that there are people that sort of have differing opinions on that, but I do think it's important just as someone that felt like it was like only me and I was like the token in many respects when I was growing up. Now, there's many people that are like, they may have a parent that might have, or sorry, a, a friend who has queer parents or a queer um, relative or a trans or intersex, like whatever. And I just think that it's so powerful to know that people are all different and they're all celebrated. And I think it's just so strong that we're not scared to live our lives as authentically as we can, even though it might seem kind of draining constantly, like coming out, because you don't really think about constantly coming out all the time, but like as draining and heavy as it might be, it, it is helping kind mm. of, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can also add, uh, like I was on a plane the other day and the person next to me at, like started up a casual conversation about like oh what do you do and I like well I an executive director of a nonprofit in Vancouver <laughs> you know like you kind of guard yourself before you especially with new people you don't and I have to sit with, next to you for like five hours yeah. and so uh, still very guarded about like how much information I share with people but like um, when I was coming out like my school in I grew up in Langley my dad jokes we were the first Chinese family to exist in Langley. And I, at the time, it didn't seem wrong. Like, we were, it was a very white, you know, um, uh, neighborhood that I grew up in. And so already being different in that aspect, um, our school did have a GSA, um, but there were, like, only two people who went, and they were straight. <laughs> and, like, you know, like, and I would always, like, walk by the door and, like, do I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I was a very big theater kid. Um, so like the theater room was kind of like an unofficial GSA um, where I felt the most safe. Um, but I didn't, I think like other people, like my parents were not, you know, they kind of understood where, where I was at, but they didn't really force the issue until uh, a friend of mine who was still in high school, so I just graduated, uh, he had come out to his parents and they were a fairly religious family and his parents like did not take it well and they said, you have to go, like you can't stay here. And so he was still in high school, so he li would basically became homeless in a day. Um, and they were like a really well-off family too. Um, and I said, well, you're going to stay with us. And I'm, a, I'm the oldest of five kids, and I'm fairly stubborn. I'm a Taurus. And mm. I was like, mom, dad, so-and-so is staying with us. And they're like, oh, OK. And I'm like, because he just came out to his family, and they don't want him living at home. And they're like, oh, OK, are you? Also, gay. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, question, yeah, like that trailing question. Like, I'm like, yes. And they're like, oh, okay. And that was like basically the end of that kind of like conversation. Um, but you know, it was still 
you know, time before I came out to grandparents and like other family and um, and you know, it turns out I have a big queer family. My sister is trans, uh, made in China, some people know. Um, my other brother is gay, and I have two sisters who are supposedly straight. So, um, <laughs> allegedly. 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 Uh, so we have a big queer family, um, and you know, having a, an older Chinese dad, it didn't actually face him. Like it was one of those things was really interesting to watch and bracing myself for, because I think we see a lot of portrayals of immigrant families being very strict and like, you know, um, especially father figures of being like wanting, you know, the next generation to be a certain way. Um, but dad has been surprisingly chill. Um, and I've actually been in the last couple of years as my dad gets older, finding myself like relieved I'm actually turning out to be like him. Like it's been really kind of like nice to like grow into that of like, oh, I am the child you raised and I'm, I'm actually quite happy that that is happening. Well, thank so, you yeah. for sharing. I think uh, I think you're so right. There's so many like there's such a diversity of experience, and I think there are a lot of kids growing up in you know Asian families who who might you know not might assume that it's just a you know generally bad experience, yeah. and uh, you know it it necessarily isn't. Um, Aureen, did you want to share? Yeah, for sure. I uh, definitely agree with the other panelists about coming out. I grew up in North Vancouver, uh, born and raised actually, born at Lionsgate Hospital up the street. Um, but for me, coming out is like a thing that happens every five to 10 years. And my first time coming out was when I was 19. Um, I had my, my Britney moment, uh, shaved my head, <laughs> and uh, wrote a letter to my group of uh, girlfriends um, from the Squamish Nation, and I wrote out basically that I was into the ladies and we all got together and read it and there were some tears but they were all like we know we already know that and I was just like yeah but this is this is official now <laughs> saying it to you. I wrote the letter <laughs> <laughs> it was in my yellow uh, happy face journal like it was it was it's real raw. <laughs> <laughs> but um that was kind of like just to my friends but about six years later I wanted to wait until I had an actual partner. And the, back then, when I was 25, it was like, I don't know if anyone remembers the website, Super Dyke. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nobody talks about Super Dyke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? Like, I'm, I'm so glad that we're talking about Super Dyke, because I think yeah. that is a, a, was a really important resource for a community for a certain time and you know nobody talks about it anymore but for a number of years that was crucial yeah. uh for for lesbians to is meet it not a thing anymore is it i don't i don't, I don't think so i, I mean so. Yeah. yeah well so it, it was before you know like online dating and and messaging yeah. there wasn't a lot of them were just for for you know hetero cis hetero yeah. people right and so there wasn't really a, a a forum, but now most of the mainstream dating sites have, um, you know, platforms yes. for queer people. So, so that was before that. It was super dyke. There was, you know, you could message people, chat, yeah. chat totally. rooms. So, yeah. what happened? Um, yeah, I met sorry. my first partner, my first girlfriend, a very hot teacher from Coquitlam. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and it, it's funny. Uh, I went until I met my first partner really and my mom is so funny she was just like you know I already knew that you were gay because you had all the uh, L word DVDs in your room they're stacked <laughs> up that would so do it. That I would already do knew it. <laughs> My brother-in-law taped them on VHS for me and would label them as like nature shows. <laughs> That's an ally. That's an ally. <laughs> but yeah, and, and when I told my family we're eating steak dinner, and I was really nervous to tell them, and I told them, and again I was just like, yeah, I'm into the ladies, and they're like, they kind of laughed, they're like, yeah, we know, mm -hmm. it's fine. But then they started asking me all these questions. They're like, are you dating so and so? Like, are you with your best friend? And we know we're not together. That's not my girlfriend. <laughs> but um, my experience uh, coming out to my family, I was just really supported. And yeah, I feel like I feel like it's every five to ten years I'm kind of coming out, and uh, I feel like I have a huge responsibility, especially to my Squamish Nation community, um, of being a role model because our young, two-spirited people are coming out like almost every day now, and they're as young as like ten years old. And a lot of people will say, you know that's too young, like they don't know what they're talking about. I'm like, but they do. Yeah, they do. And it can change, like you need to stop 
thinking that you know your, your identity is one thing and then it doesn't change like it's like being a doctor going to school for a doctor and then you're a doctor your whole life it's like you know you can come out and it could change it's it's a, a total spectrum so I'm just so proud of our young people for being strong enough and almost kind of like jealous because they they've got it earlier <laughs> you know they've got that strength earlier but it's because of people like like I don't want to toot my own horn but like me who are just out and proud and so they feel safe to do that as well I mean, it's why representation matters, right? Like to see, to see the, the image of yourself and other people like you, it, it's so important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, for a lot of people, pride can, can be a first sort of, uh, or, or, you know, a major experience, their first pride, um, whether it's the parade or, or another event. Um, do any of you want to share about that that experience? Um, you know, the first time attending one of those sort of public queer events or participating in in sort of activism publicly around around Pride. I mean, I could just I think it. I don't remember the first time I went to Pride, but I remember always coming home from Pride because I was always on the Sky Train, and you're like, when you get on the Sky Train, and like you can hold hands with someone, but then the further away from Vancouver you get, you start like distancing, like you start taking off the beads and like making sure you look different. But that joy of just being, I always remember like you know on my way home feeling the happiest. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not like I got sad as I went home. It's just like you just kind of have to do those things to protect yourself. Um, but. I think that's what I remember f most from my first Pride. Like, I don't actually remember when it was or what I did or if I, you know, I went to different events, but I just remember that feeling of like going into Granville Station and everyone being around you with rainbows and things like that. And then, you know, that feeling of like, that's what you're supposed to be. And then like realizing when you get close to home, it's like, oh, like it gets a bit crunchier the further away from Pride you get. I remember my first Pride um, parade very, very clearly because uh, um, we had formed Legit in uh, 1992, 93, and so it it was it would have been like 93, 94, and we came together and we said we have to we have to be visible, we have to be there, and so we made this huge big banner that says something like Love Across Borders or something like that, and and so there weren't that many of us because we were still small at the, at that time, and uh, but it was it was an amazing feeling to actually be able to be there, to walk together with a whole bunch of people that had very similar kind of beliefs and commitments and, and, and it was extremely empowering to actually be so visible and, and, and in a way take back that power uh, because when you're invisible you, you lose so much power but being out there and in the Pride Parade it, it, really, it really gave us that, well it gave me and also I know other people and I was there with Bridget my partner and it was just a wonderful experience to be able to walk down uh, well, we didn't start at Robson Street like we do now, but we <laughs> to walk down to walk down to to towards Sunset Beach, you know, with uh, with my partner and with other and with other people, and and it was just wonderful. Yeah, I really was really important for me. Did did you find at that time, you know, just being out there, um, you know, holding that banner? Did did people learn about what you all were trying to do? through seeing it in in the parade? Yes. Yeah, they did. And that was one of the other reasons why we said we need to we need to do this because we need people to know that um, that 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 it, there are possibilities in terms of if you're if you're Canadian and you have a partner who's not Canadian, that there are ways that you can you, we can navigate the system. Um, the the other time that for me in terms of the Pride Parade that was probably e equally as powerful was the first Pride Parade with Rainbow Refugee. I remember that Pride Parade so clearly because there were so many folks who were members of Rainbow Refugee who were afraid, afraid that they would that they would get picked up by on the TV, that people back home might see them. They they were really afraid for their safety, and so we came up with this plan that we would all wear masks. And we bought from the flag store. We bought these masks that they were all identical, all like the same, all the full face, all the full uh, face okay. and we all wore white. 
And I remember us walking down that, walking down the street, and, and there at that point there prop, there were a lot of us, probably 20, 30 people, all in white. And I remember the response of the crowd. It was so amazing that people really responded, uh, because I think we made such a, a visible. We were so visible, and it was such a visual impact. So that that for me was probably the second second most I've been in many many pride parades but those two were very significant ones for me yeah and and it was important for me personally but also important in terms of the people the people who were watching right to be able to communicate um, communicate something about who we were and what we do and why we why we do what we do that it's really important to people's lives you know Yes, we have fun, and we also do serious things. Yeah, and and, and just picking up on that, right? There's, uh, you know, I, I, it's important for the celebration, because I think for for many people, uh, especially in the past, less so so now, but c continuing, there aren't enough opportunities for the celebration of our community. But that that activism piece is is the history of it, right? And, mm -hmm. and yeah. continues to be the most important. Yeah, and it, and it is for so many people who are newcomers who come here, it is for them oftentimes the very first opportunity they have to actually be out with a group of people who identify in similar ways to what they do, regardless of what countries they come from. They're all here and they're all making a new life for themselves. So it, it really is important for them. Anybody else want to share about Pride? Um, I'll go. Um, it was actually one of the first Pride parades that I DJed in. And that was the parade in 2013. And I literally don't want to go another year uh, without participating, like being on a float uh, if I'm not <laughs> DJing, because it's just an amazing experience. Like I've, I've watched the parade for years, but I'd never done that. So I DJed on the Reconciliation Canada float, and it was just so much fun. It was so hot out, I remember, and the parade didn't start moving for like an hour or two, and the friends I invited were getting so impatient. But then when when it went through, it was, it was amazing. And I have a really cool story about that. Um, I remember getting home, that evening and I was just so tired, so tired. But then um, a Twitter notification came up and it was a picture of me on the float and it said, look at DJ Osho looking so hot. I was like, oh, who is this? And I looked and it was my current partner. <laughs> We've been together since then. Oh, wow. So if it wasn't for the Pride Parade, That's I would have so never met her. And she's amazing. She's Afro-Indigenous as well. And we're just still, still together. So. It's, uh, it's amazing. Just so like those Twitter DMs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, back then. So, <laughs> so that was my first experience of Pride, and I'll never forget that. Bringing people together. <laughs> Bringing people together. So great. <laughs> I know Pride, Pride is complicated, and people's opinions of Pride uh, have evolved and changed over the years. People's experience with, with Pride has changed, right, starting from uh, you know, early early activism uh, to being you know just hot men in in booty shorts to you know what it, what it is today. Uh, lots of different opinions from everything about community groups to uh, you know corporate participation. Does anybody want to share about some of the the thoughts that they have about about the evolution of pride? Well, I just had a, one thing to say just about like the last question and <laughs> when you said hot men in booty shorts, unfortunately <laughs> that sparked a memory for me. So um, it wasn't my first um, uh, pride parade, but it's a image I have vividly of like being with many queer friends and like I mentioned before, I was pretty much the only black person in my friend circle and pretty much the only queer person that I knew of at the time in my friend circle and living in Coquitlam. And I was at this point living downtown and all my friends were downtown friends. And I remember this one person, very muscular, uh, black, they were feeling their full fantasy and just living their best life dancing like towards me right in the corner of uh, Davey and Denman 
and ease on down the road was playing and they were like living their best life and I was just like oh my gosh you're so cute this is like so much euphoria for me just because it was someone that was uh, black seemingly queer possibly not regardless they were living their best life and I loved that but it was just like affirming to see someone that was like similar to me at the time and I just like didn't know how much I needed to see that even though it was just like a, a random moment, but it was something that I still think of to this day and how powerful that something as little as that can be on anyone's life. So I thought that was quite cool. I've kind of had some evolving, e evolving thoughts and, and attitudes and beliefs around over the years in terms of the development of the Pride Parade. And I mean, my, the thing is, my life, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an activist. And so, um, so that to me is an area of my life that's really important. And I also believe it's uh, uh, really important in the life of our community. And, and it still continues to be important. I mean, I'm so conscious of, of how, easy it, how easily we can lose some of the rights that we've, that we've gained. I mean, we see what's happening south of the border. And so it's, we can't just take for granted um, the gains that we've made. So I think, you know, in terms of the Pride Parade, that statement of, um, you know, like we're here, we're queer, and we're not going anywhere. You know, so get get used to it, right? We're here. Um, so for me, it, for me, it's really important that there be something of a balance. I know, I know, I had a real re a lot of conflicts around the whole corporate involvement stuff, and then I thought, and I and I look at the people that are in the parade that you know have the various corporations on their trucks and cars. First of all, I was really pissed off because they had a lot of money. And we here we were, you know, nickeling and diming and working for hours and hours to put together something. I thought, why the hell don't you give some of your money to us so that we could have a, a, a better display in, in, in the Power Pride Parade? But the other thing was that so many of the people who are participating were also queer. And so <laughs> for them, it was part of their life. It, it was part of who they are. It, in, in total, both in terms of their own identity and also in terms of the work that they did. And they were being visibly out. So, you know, it, it, I've lived with that conflict. Um, it's, it's not an easy one to, to kind of resolve. And um, you ask me one day or one year and I have one opinion, you ask me another year and I might have a different opinion, right? Um, I know the last previous couple of years before the pandemic there was all the stuff around around the police and the police involvement and the hard decisions that uh, pride society had to make around that and you know and the challenge as it was for us as a rainbow refugee as an organization like it was really important for us to be in the parade and it was also really important for us to acknowledge that many of the folks who were who are members of our organization are people of color and they have come from countries where their experience of police is not not a, no nowhere near positive that they are the agents of persecution and that people here still continue to have that experience of being of police being agents of persecution so again there's that conflict like there are police who are members of our community. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with that? And at the same time, recognizing some of the complexities that there are in terms of, um, certainly in terms of most of the people in my life and their experience of, 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 of police and policing. Um, so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, none of it's really simple. Uh, there's so many different perspectives and and as I say on any given day my my thoughts will change depending to a great extent on who I'm listening to and who's got their opinion so yeah it's complicated it certainly is I appreciate you bringing that up Chris I want to just you know vocalize my admiration um, of BLM Vancouver for having and, and the Pride Society for having those hard conversations and um, you know I learned a lot around that time thanks to the you know folks doing that work and having those tough um, and sometimes quite public um, discussions about you know police and pride and um, yeah yeah so I'm glad it came up and I know it's like a 
can be a delicate, you know, thing to talk about in the context of like a pride panel. But you know, we need to have those conversations and you know um, face the um, realities of discrimination and, and oppression that exist within our community, not just from outside of it. I, I wanted to to shift gears a little bit. We've spent a little bit of time talking about the activism and. Um, but it, only because you mentioned it before and we, we chatted a little bit about Super Dyke, but the way, <laughs> that, um, the way that our community meets and gets together um, has certainly evolved, you know, especially now with, with all of the, the opportunities for online interaction. It wasn't always that way, right? Like there weren't um, a lot of opportunities. So I, I was wondering if anybody wanted to share, uh, you know, their experiences about, uh, you know, getting together as a community from going to maybe being, you know, the only queer person that you knew or one of a few to, to find in that community. Um, anybody want to talk about that? <laughs> Thanks, Camilla. Talk about, talk about Man Up. <laughs> um, sure, I can share a little um, story that kind of connects to my coming out process and stuff. I grew up in uh, Ladner, so like a, a suburb south of Vancouver. And um, there's actually a lot of queer people that have come out of Ladner. They say something's in the water. Um, but uh, it took until I was kind of moving out and going to school um, and living in the city for me to sort of be, you know, out and proud. Anyway, I um, joined Super Dyke or like heard of it somehow, um, you know, went to Lick and um, started to meet people and I had been a server for a few years and so I just kind of as I was getting to know people and becoming a regular approached the bar manager at the time Jesse and um, it was a very accessible um, process for like booking events it was sort of like a queer run not owned but like a queer operated space um, and I had seen other people do it and I said you know heck my birthday's coming up I want to do something special like let's do a fundraiser and have a little show and that kind of by accident turned out to be a sort of proto man up event and um, I joined forces with a few of the members of DKU Drag Kings United uh, sort of like Vancouver Drag King troop of the day um, to, to start the show. So yeah, so that was kind of Lick and um, the sort of Gastown neighborhood um, are is sort of central to my like early out queer experiences in in Vancouver and my first place was a uh, basically an art studio that I was, you know, it, I don't know if illegally, but you know, improperly <laughs> living in, <laughs> like showering in the mop closet down the hall. Um, I would have like, you know, after parties, after going to Hershey and whatever, and um, it was really, it was wild and fun and we survived it and it was just a really cool way to sort of meet people and come into my, you know, identity uh, sort of organically as, a, as an organizer, yeah. Well, because we have you and Carmela here, I wanted to talk also about the, the, the place that drag um, has in that like coming together experience uh, for, for our community. I think a, a lot of people, whether it's just, you know, either participating in or just watching and coming to, to enjoy it, it, it holds such a central, central space in that community building. I feel like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> you, you take it away, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there's time for everybody to yeah. talk yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Like, please. I mean, it's it's remarkable how uh, much drag has just had this, I don't want to say renaissance, it's not like it ever went anywhere, but um, it's just, you know, drag in Vancouver has been on a bit of a journey, and these last few years there's been, I mean, ye like years ago when Man Up was at the Cobalt, we were saying, you know, is the is the Vancouver market saturated for drag? And like, there were one tenth of the shows and performers at that time, you know, that as that there are now. And uh, you know, the fact that you know we can say that we live in a city where you can pretty much find a drag show any night of the week. I mean, that was something I only thought of being, a, you know, reality in like New York City or like you know somewhere that was way cooler than Vancouver. But we're just an absolute like epicenter of this incredible like boundary pushing, you know, um, gender performance art. It's so special, and there's so many talented people that are just like. This is why I don't perform anymore because I just can't compete. <laughs> it's just <laughs> incredible. Yeah. You so can, liar. <laughs> yeah. 
I feel really, um, really privileged um, and honored to sort of like been able to, you know, be a part of that um, process, you know, and just see these cool things um, existing and being born that, um, you know, may or may not have any direct connection to to man up per se. But um, yeah, it's just truly um, a fertile environment for for drag. And I'm just I'm obsessed with drag. I love I love queer performers. They're just the best. Yeah. I also think that drag lends itself to sort of like a a come as you are kind of element. And so I think that's what makes people drawn to drag. It's like you can be yourself, you can be a caricature of yourself, you can just sort of come as you are and present whatever to an audience. And I think that there is some vulnerability in like showing your authentic self to an audience of people that may or may not like it. And I just think that in of itself creates a really close community because you're being vulnerable with people and people are talking to you before or after the show and like getting to know you as a person. So I think it definitely with things like all the drag race shows and like just call me mother, everything going on right now, it gives everyone a chance to sort of hone what it means to be them and find their spark so that they can present that to the world and live authentically. Um, yeah. Now, Brandon, I'm going to ask you because, you know, <laughs> you, you talked a little bit about growing up in Langley yeah. um, and, and coming out. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you navigated through that, that finding community? Uh, the dating scene in Langley? Yeah. Um, the, the hot <laughs> gay dating scene in Langley. Uh, well, I didn't have, well, there wasn't like, at the time I don't recall there being like a specifically, well, there was like gay.com, which you could talk on like chat rooms with people, which was like super sketchy for like a teenager to do, but did anyways, because... It's no super dice. Yeah, it's no super dice. <laughs> But I, the site I used was called Facepick. It was precursor to Facebook. It was like oh. this like random site where you just put like a, you know a couple photos of yourself and you can talk like what's your favorite like movies and music and uh, and you the reason why it was so important is because you could search by location and also gender and who they're looking for, what gender the other person's looking for, so you could actually like use it as like a gay dating site. Mm -hmm. And so I met many of my first like boyfriends on that site and like. Langley, the date you went on was you went to like this coffee shop that was the only cool one in town that wasn't Tim Hortons or something. It was called Ethical Addictions, um, <laughs> which I think was owned by like I think it was actually owned by like a pastor, like because oh. he wanted a space for like <laughs> kids to hang out. That was like, and it was actually like a nice coffee shop. But then Langley, being Langley, like it closed down because too many kids were hanging out there, which was like suburban things. Anyways, uh, but I met my first partner off that website, and we were together for like 11, 11 years. Um, and yeah, it was uh, a very, it was the only way I met people, because I was living in Langley, there wasn't any social events to go to, really, that were around. Um, and I think even still, Langley suffers a bit from the lack of like events and stuff like that. Like I know like for, for my work at, at On Screen, like I pay very close attention to what services are available for youth in different cities. and like. We know like Surrey has its own pride, New West has a pride, like there's Fraser Valley pride, but then there's Langley in the middle that's still, still not quite there yet. Like I know him has services and also Surrey and also in the Valley and it, Langley's kind of in the middle and they still haven't kind of gotten there. Although one of my exes is actually a city councilor in Langley, so. Yeah. Um, connected to everybody people. is now Googling the Langley City <laughs> Council page and trying to figure Sorry it out. Sorry if he sees this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was kind of uh, my jam. And then also like when I like when I moved to Burnaby, I was now closer to Vancouver and my community became uh, these different queer parties around town, um, bent or or whatnot, and Man Up, and the Cobalt became like my like queer home. And I have seen so many beautiful things and things I cannot unsee on the Cobalt stage. <laughs> um, but it was like, that. those were my formative years of like, it wasn't necessarily the bar itself, but the different parties that came to the bar. Mm -hmm. And like the different flavors of queerness that you got that you didn't get um, like on Davie Street. And not that there's anything wrong with that, it just wasn't my, wasn't my vibe. And, um, and my sister, Made in China, who I've watched 
grow from like the first ink I remember going to one of her shows, first show I saw her, she looked like my mom. <laughs> like just the way it make it like I'm like, oh this is uncomfortable. She just looked like mom. <laughs> <laughs> but she was such a like an amazing performer and then I saw her do like Mr. Ms. Cobalt and Cobalt All Stars and then um, Vancouver's Next Drag Superstar at uh, Celebrities and I have never seen people like cry in a good way at a drag show before. And she, like she has made people cry like it's like wild to see the power that drag can have um, from the joyous like comedic to also the very serious um, and so it's been a it's been an honor to watch my sister grow that way That's but so yeah lovely. Chris I'm guessing when you were starting to form community uh, it was before there was Super Dyke. So <laughs> I was hoping that you could maybe tell us tell a little us. bit about, about what that was, that experience was like meeting people. Well, I remember when, when we first came back to, when we first came, when we first came back to Canada, to BC and trying to figure out, trying to figure out negotiations. Cause I, I left when I was 17 and I come back and I'm 47, 48, you know, like, it's been a, a lifetime, and so I don't know what's happening in Vancouver. I don't know what this, what anything. So, in those days, we had telephone books, and so we went down. We went down all of the things that started with L and all of the things that started with W, to see if we could find places that we might be able to find other women, other lesbians through those through those two connections, and that's how we began. Um, making making those connections you no know? <laughs> i mean the, the first the first group i remember we went to we went to a lesbian group on a sunday afternoon in port coquitlam mm -hmm. <laughs> yes yeah. exactly that was the very first lesbian group that i ever participated was in in port coquitlam so you know even then we found our ways the other thing that i that's coming to my mind that i just want to mention is the gandhi dancer the Gandhi dancer, which was, which is now, oh yeah, look at I was like, what? what? <laughs> exactly. Where, where was the that? Gandhi dancer. It's where the, um, what's the, what's the community center there? Roundhouse. Yes. Oh, yeah. Where like the roundhouse was. was. Yeah, 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 where, where the roundhouse was. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, yeah. It, was yeah, it was great, and it was a place where many of us went. I mean, there was the lotus that was down underneath there, on Abbott Street. But the Gandhi Dancer was a was a great place, and lots of lesbians would go there. So you know, in, in back in those days, we used a lot of that networking in terms of connections with each other. And then this group would say, "Well, let's put on a dance." And then the word would go out, and everybody would go to the dance. You know, so prior to the days of um, of the internet and social networking, we found ways to network. <laughs> I, lo I love that telephone book story. Yes. That is so good. In the telephone book, did it say like lesbian or did it say women? Like something? Yes, oh, that's it did. what okay. that's what we were looking for. We oh, found, okay. I, and so I remember the very first place I went to was. Um, on uh, no, where the heck was it? It's it was in the on the east side, and it was where the women's the women's center was. Not the women's center, but the National Organization for Women. And we went there, and so we we made an appointment to go in and talk to somebody. And guess what? The woman sitting at the desk was a lesbian. So you know, it's sort of like little by little you make those kind of connections, and one thing leads to another, which is probably exactly the same kind of thing that happens now. Just that we were using different sorts of technology yeah, in those days. Yeah, you took a little more Fingers effort. Fingers into telephone. <laughs> <book. laughs> yes. Well, one thing I was grateful for was I had. It was like a youth group, so sort of like word of mouth. It was called Gab, and oh, I believe yes. it's still a thing to this day at Community. But yeah, it's just like, I, I used a website <laughs> on the interwebs. Um, but yeah, it was just like every Friday or Wednesday, you were able to come as you were and just sort of the idea was mingle with other queer youth. And it was just like a nice formative moment because at that time I didn't have queer friends. So it was nice to sort of arrive in a place where everyone was more or less starting at the same level and actually like my pride story earlier was with those friends that I had at that time so it was like what I needed at that time and it was a great jumping off point for creating those relationships and then 
as we grew and like found interest in drag or whatever, the word of mouth piece sort of comes into it and you gravitate towards the things that you're interested in. I know we could probably talk about so much of this <laughs> stuff forever, <laughs> but you know, just to sort of close things out, I wanted to ask each of you, you know, this year, uh, going into the Pride season, the, the Pride theme is Together Again. And that celebrates the beauty that comes in reuniting and uplifting 2SLGBTQ uh, AI plus communities, centering BIPOC voices. Um, and, you know, we all know that over the past two years, so many of us have missed out on those chances to gather and connect and share. And so, uh, with that in mind, um, anybody want to share about what they're, you know, how they're planning on celebrating Pride this year, what they're looking forward to the most? Well, every time I hear it together again, I think of the Janet Jackson Janet song. Jackson. <laughs> and she's like my favorite artist of all time. Like, that's my dream is to DJ for her. And she's from the same city as my father, Gary, Indiana. So, like, keep putting it out to the yeah. universe. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen. The camera. Yes. 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 Make a plea right now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting and I, I love that song too. It's, um, I don't know if people know the basis of the song, the story of what it's about. Uh, one of her friends that passed away um, from AIDS, that's what the song is about, that they're going to be together again. And I, I love that it, it makes me think of that because we're all going to be getting together for Pride. And I've heard nothing but excitement because we haven't celebrated since 2019. I actually asked, uh, because I'm on the Vancouver uh, Pride Society board, if I could be Grand Marshal again, because I was in 2019, <laughs> but I got denied because it was so much fun. <laughs> and I've asked if I can hold like a Grand Marshal boot camp for this year. That <laughs> like, would have be running so laps, cool. Waving, because I remember how sore my arm got <laughs> <laughs> out of the car. But yeah, we're just so excited and having our people just come back together and the parade, I'm excited as well. And it, for me, I have to decide on which float I want to DJ on. So uh, that, that's- You probably have choices. Yeah, <laughs> that's gonna be a hard decision for me. I just want to be everywhere. And just, it makes me think of memories of past years uh, of Pride and the parade and, and everybody getting together. And I think it's, I think it's gonna be so much fun. Anyone else wanna, wanna share what they're looking forward to the most? Uh, I mean, I don't know if anyone's like me, but it's like, I'm an executive director of an LGBT organization, so Pride season is just work. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I mean, for me, like, uh, like Pride, like, well, you know, for the, the Vancouver Queer Film Festival this year, August 11th to 21st, um, which you should come to after your Pride, um, we are, aren't as, like, going to be 100% like it was pre-pandemic, but we're, you know, we're going to bring things back about 50% of what things used to be, and... Um, taking high precautions because a lot of our audience also are older folks with immune, you know, compromised systems or disabilities, and so we want to make it, you know, as inclusive as possible for folks to come together. And like the, like I've been working, like I volunteered actually with the the Vancouver Queer Festival in 2009. I still have my original like volunteer T-shirt that I still wear. Uh. Um, and so it's a, obviously an organization that's dear to my heart. And I know that for some folks like who aren't, you know they don't party, like the, the Queer Film Festival is their pride. Like they get together with friends in lines and um, you know, and I, I also split uh, Pride Sunday usually with friends and then I go over to Powell Street Festival to get some food because the food at Powell Street is always top notch. Um, but also it's kind of also queer. Like it's, you know, Powell Street will pump up like queer events and we'll pump them up and it's like this really lovely weekend in the city and um, hoping folks can enjoy it, you know, however they want and um, Feel a little lighter this year, hopefully, but you know, still, still cautious as we as we go into the season, though. Of course. In the last uh, week, um, week and a half, we went from um, having zero confirmed venues available to do our like Eastside Studios Pride program and Man Up and stuff to having two. So that was, a, it's been a very exciting um, week and everyone's feeling really energized and preemptively a bit overwhelmed because it's an incredibly intense uh, period where, you know, 
70% of the year's labor of queer organizing happens in two weekends or a week. Um, but yeah, feeling really excited about that and the fact that we're able to do, we have like an outdoor location and then the Eastside Studios spot um, will be able to do, uh, accommodate all of our sort of in-house events. So everyone will get a spot and a stage and you know, the space to do their magic. So yeah, we're pretty excited. and. Um, yeah, having two, we've never done that before. So the fact that we're, you know, coming back after a couple pandemic years um, to, you know, celebrate in person and, you know, we're at our kind of, you know, biggest, you could say, um, as, as an organization and a, and a sort of network of, of events is, uh, is really exciting. So, yeah, trying to rest up now. <laughs> yep. Yes, rest up, stay hydrated. Um, years ago when I was still working when I was employed. Um, I had a small group. I was employed at the center, now known as Community. And I, ha I was a facilitator, a small group called Chronically Queer. And so it was a bunch of folks that had various health issues, chronic health conditions. And so we actually, ad that group advocated with the Pride Society to say, we need to have at least one place on the Pride, on the Pride March where people with disabilities or health issues could actually go and watch the parade and feel feel comfortable and safe. And so I remember that first year, the, the tent going up along Beach Avenue and then over the years seeing it expand and I had I myself was there one year. So this year I'm not sure, like because because I'm now an amputee and I'm gonna be eighty this year, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to I mean, I could always ride, I ride, <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to be able to do any marching anymore. But just that notion of being with, uh, with a bunch of people um, after such a long time for two years. I'm also a member of Quirky, the Queer Imaging and Writing Collective for Elders. For two years, every week we have met on Zoom for two solid years. We didn't even have a summer break this year. So it's actually, it's actually the thought of being able to see people, see the embodied people, right? Not just this from, from the top of your head to, the, to your shoulders. Um, I think it's gonna be so wonderful. And you know, I think we're, we're still cautious. Uh, I'm still cautious. Uh, in terms of health issues and having been dubbed one of those more older vulnerable people. <laughs> <laughs> I belong to that category, the older vulnerable person now, um, which is kind of a strange designation. But you know, I think it, like you were saying, Gwen, it is important to, that people are still being cautious. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're gonna have a mixture of, of both. But you know, I had a hug from somebody the other day <laughs> And it was so wonderful to actually be able to hug somebody for the first time in, in a long time. And I think, you know, I don't know about the rest of you, but that's something that I've missed in my life. You know, I don't have a partner and, and I live alone. And so that physical connection, that touch that we, that we, I mean, we're queer for heaven's mm. sake, right? <laughs> touch is something that's really important in our lives. So it'll be great to be able to see people, touch people, hug people. Yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. Well. I just want to thank all of you for for sharing your your stories and your time and your hearts with with all of us um, and uh, really really looking forward to hopefully seeing you uh, at some point through, throughout Pride uh, and thank you to everyone who was able to join us for another uh, really amazing queer history panel. <laughs>